of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is not a trick question, uh, but I don't want any of the ministers who sat in this row over here a couple days ago as we went through the services to answer, okay? I want to see if people know. Why did we walk in here and lie down, uh, face down here on the, on the floor of the sanctuary? Anybody know? Pardon? Why? Uh, nothing even more. Well, let me ask this question. I'll give it away. If somebody were going to attack you and you lay down flat on your face like this, would you be able to defend yourself very well? No, but if you were on your back, at least you could kick them and swing your arms. When a man becomes a deacon or a priest or a bishop too, I imagine, they have to lie prostrate on the floor like that because they are saying with their body, I give myself completely, Lord, to you. Take anything, take everything. I will not hold anything back. It's a, it's a posture of handing yourself over. Why do we kneel? It's a posture of adoration. Why do we stand? Because we stand up and lift up our prayer. Um, all these gestures that we do have meaning. And this one, uh, I've always loved it since I was a kid and got to be an altar server on Good Friday and, and had to lie on the floor there with the priest and, and realize that we were handing ourselves over to God completely. I think that the whole spirit of this day is that, handing ourselves over completely. Now, the first two readings are about, well, the first reading is about the suffering servant, and Isaiah, about 700 years before Jesus walked the face of the earth, he wrote uh, several passages that they called the suffering servant oracles. And in them, he speaks in these oracles about um, his face being, his beard being plucked and his back being buffeted and, and they're beating on him and calling him names. And there's no defense. He does nothing to defend himself. He allows himself to go through this suffering. And I believe the oracles were spoken to Israel to say that Israel, that's what you will have to go through. You will suffer and struggle, but the Lord will be there with you and you'll come out on the other end of this. But somehow seven years later, the early Christians saw this all applied to Jesus and it was like a perfect fit. A perfect fit because that's Jesus on the cross. He is victim, and yet he's not victimized. Or he's victimized, but he refuses to be called a victim. But more than in any of the other passion stories in the Gospel of John, there are a few uh, elements that are just unique to John. In the first couple chapters, where Jesus does his first public miracle, but it isn't called a miracle, it's called a sign, the first of his signs. He's at the wedding feast in Cana. And as you recall, his mother walks by and says, hey, Jesus, they're running out of wine. Do something. And he says, woman, how does this concern me? And he says these words, my hour has not yet come. And he will repeat that several times in the gospel. My hour has not yet come. But when he comes to the passion, he says, my hour is now upon me. But Jesus, in John's Gospel, chooses it. And there's another element I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but it's a, it's a beautiful one, and it's only in John. When Jesus is in the garden and the soldiers come with Judas to arrest him, in all of the stories they arrest him and there's the cutting off of the ear of the servant and all of that. But in this Gospel alone, when they ask, when they come to him, he says, I am. The very words that we hear from the burning bush in the Exodus story. Uh, the words of God, I, I'm not someone, I, I am. Just, I am. And uh, when he identifies those words, he is connecting himself to that burning bush and to any other time that God in the Scriptures uses that phrase, I am. But the wonderful thing that happens in the story of John is when he says, I am, 
all of the soldiers with weapons, with weapons who could attack and kill him on the spot, they fall to the ground. They fall to the ground. And John's gospel is saying, Jesus is not some helpless little lamb led to the slaughter. He is that, but he's much more. He hands himself over. He says, I am going to give myself completely. I will be prostrate before you, God, and whatever happens to me, it must be. I think to myself that this is an important spirituality for us. So, you know, if we only look at this passion today and think of 2,000 years ago and think of what Jesus went through, I suppose on one level that's enough. But how does it apply to us? What's it supposed to do to us or for us? Because as we go through life, I think we face a lot of obstacles and tensions and struggles, rejection, a lot of pain, suffering, physical, emotional, sociological. We, we struggle. We have crosses in life. And the question is, as we become victim, as we become suffering servants, what happens, not just to our bodies, but what happens to our spirit? What kind of people do we become? You know, we're looking at something that is going to be uh, written about and talked about for over 100 years, I'm sure, what's going on in the Ukraine. And here's a people that one man is trying to wipe them, literally wipe them and their cities off the face of the earth. Uh, it seems rather clear. If he could get them all to leave their land, he just wants to take back their land and say, this belongs to Russia. Wow. But my question is this. What he's doing is clear enough. It's ugly enough, and it's, it's not a, at all a problem to name it or call it for what it is. But my question is about these poor Ukrainians. Let's say they defeat Russia, which it looks like they might. And let's say they come back. Hey, they have to rebuild cities from the ground up. I was thinking just the other day, just clearing the rubbish. I, it, it would take them more than a year, maybe a few years, to clear away all the things that have been burned and destroyed, all the piping, everything, everything has to be redone completely. But apart from rebuilding the physical places, what will happen inside these people? And this is a good and important question, even though we can't probably really understand it or really connect with it or, or in any way experience it completely. But I think it's an important question to ask about them for us. And if we put ourselves in their shoes, if you were a woman and took your child and put that child on a train, 10 years old, and sent them hundreds of miles away, so that you could attend to your poor mother who's ailing and may not make it through this? If you were a member of the parliament, one of the women, several of the women who, who took their children to Poland and then they came back. They came back because they say, I'm in the parliament, I have to do this for my country. And the countless people, even women, picking up guns and learning how to use them. Old grandma's there with guns. It's funny, but it's not funny because they say, I have to defend my land. So it's all over, let's say. Let's just say, oh, praise God, let's say in a month this ends. And they begin the process of healing. What will they be like inside their souls? Could you ever forgive such a thing? You might have cousins who live in Russia. What do you do with that? What happens to your inner spirit? That's why I think this cross is so important. So, this is why it's so central to our faith. Because we all have our crosses. Some are very big. Some go on for years and years. Some are catastrophic, like what's going on in Ukraine. But we all get them. We all get the crosses. That's all there is to it. But the question is, what does it do to us? Who do we become? How will we live our lives after this? Well, Jesus was the model. And although he doesn't say it in John's Gospel, he only says it in Luke, but he says it. Father, forgive them all. They know not what they do. 
And in all of the gospel stories, all of the passions, never once does he call them names or, or spew out any condemnations against them. He accepts what comes to him. He is the suffering servant of that first reading, even though it was written 700 years before. He shows us how to do it. He shows us how to do it. We're going to continue, and um, a couple things are going to happen right now. First of all, in just a moment or two, there will be a collection. And this is taken up over the whole world. And um, it's the Holy Land collection. And the reason it's significant is because uh, the Holy Land, there's, there are very few Christians there. Very few Christians and Catholics. But there are Christians and Catholics and Protestants and Jews and people of Islam that are there to attend to the, this holy place. The Holy Land, they call it. The Holy Land. It's the intersection of these three major religions. And the way that we take care of it is with our money. We send money to these religious orders and priests and people, nuns, who, who take care of this holy land. So that when people want one day to understand that better, they go to that holy place and they take it all in. They walk the steps where Jesus walked. And somehow it brings people to a greater sense of what it's all about. So that's what we're going to do. And after that, we're going to pray these ten intercessions. But the, the unique thing about them is this is the only day of the year that I'm aware of that over the whole earth, all Catholics pray these same ten intentions. Obviously translated in their own language, but they're the same prayers. That's that's over a billion people united in prayer. You know where the scriptures say wherever two or three are gathered in prayer? And you know, if you've ever been in a place where you're really sorrowful or in pain and you ask someone to pray with you, please, come with me. Please, would you pray with me and pray for me? And let's say literally, like the gospel says, two or three join in prayer. Why? People say, because there's a power in prayer when people are united in prayer. Well, today, over a billion people well over a billion people are united in these ten prayers. And so what does that do to us again, to our spirit, to know that we are uniting with well over a billion people in these prayers and their sessions? So please, even though they're long, if we pay attention, listen to who we pray for and to what we pray for as we do it together. So at this time, they'll take up the collection of the Holy Land and then we'll continue with our intercessions.